Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Brian Thatcher, and welcome to Mercy Unbound. It's a show that aims to provide hope and avenue for healing, and one that will hopefully help you better understand and then live the great mercy of God. Very excited today. I have a special guest, Dr. Gilbert Lavoie from Massachusetts. He's been studying and fascinated by the Shroud of Turin for over 40 years. Uh, in the late 1970s, he found a book by French surgeon, Dr. Pierre Barbet, titled A Doctory at Calvary. When I saw that, I was uh, kind of shocked because I had that book in my library too from years ago and read it. And as a, two doctors here, you know, he knew how to uh, look at things anatomically and explain the shroud. Um, to, but today we're going to discuss Dr. Lavoie's book, The Shroud of Jesus and the Sign John Ingeniously Concealed. Sophia uh, Institute printed it. Uh, you can order the book at sophiainstitute.com or on Amazon, but it, it's a really interesting read, and I found it fascinating, and I'm just tickled that Dr. Lavoie is joining us today. So welcome to Mercy Unbound, Doctor. Paul, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. You've been studying the Shroud for over 40 years. You know, I, I get comments on the internet on different talks and things, and, and you can tell some people know very little about the Shroud, but they think it's fake, and Jesus was a myth, and on and on it goes. Um, there were many people, I hear this thing often, there were many people crucified on a cross in the time of Jesus. So what makes this shroud so unique? Well, uh, it, it is unique, and just for your audience and some of them that may not understand the shroud at all, the shroud is a cloth that's 14 feet long, uh, three, three and a half feet wide, and, and on this cloth is a very faint image of a naked man, the front and back of a naked man. And uh, there's also uh, parallel marks uh, that we're not concerned about, but they happened during a, a fire in 1532. Uh, and on on this cloth also are blood marks, and they're all consistent with what we actually read about in the Gospel of John. What you read about in John with regard to what happened to Jesus is exactly what you find on this shroud. So uh, what makes this cloth so unique, first of all, is that these blood marks are so, I, they're, they, they just parallel exactly what John says. That's, that's one thing that really is, is amazing, just the blood marks themselves. And then we have, of course, this image the image of the front and back of a man, which is really very unique. And as we know, a lot of people know that uh, the cloth was uh, photographed in 1898. And at that point in time, it was discovered that uh, uh, there was a beautiful positive image in the negative uh, plate that uh, Secunda Pia, when he took his photograph, he, when he went to the dark room, he looked at that negative plate. It was a positive image. He felt he was seeing Jesus himself for the first time and uh the and then he realized that what was on this cloth was a negative image and what's fascinating about that there's a negative image on the cloth and it, that was not uh and, and uh, that was done in the <clears throat> you have to ask this cloth was very very old years and years before in the invention of photography and so forth so here we have this magnificent negative image that turns into a beautiful positive image and at the same time when we look at the cloth we see the uh, in the positive image blood is on the cloth and that's positive but in the negative the blood is a negative so it's very it's unique in so many ways just just by by that information at all absolutely and so then people began to study this cloth and they got very they were fascinated by it for so many years until uh, there was a, a real uh, problem that happened in, uh, well, I should say an event that took place in 1988 when the carbon dating was done of the clause stating that uh, they felt that this was a 14th century uh, fake. And uh, that put a damper on the interest of the shroud. In fact, even at that time, I had been studying it for, uh, for 10 years and uh, I, I, I accepted the date but it was like uh, I had in my mind two two truths that were hitting each other. You know, the data was so good. 
I can remember I was invited to give a talk with a, a large group of gentlemen and uh, about two weeks before uh, the uh, carbon dating came out. And when I came over there, I said, I don't know if you really want to hear a lecture today. This, this has been carbon dated as a 14th century artifact. But I said, I'll go on and talk to you about it and tell you what uh, 50, 50 scientists uh, thought about this when they did the study in uh, 1978. And, I show you, and I'll show you some of the work that I've done from a medical perspective. So by the time I got through, I, I said, well, here you go. I said, uh, I've given you all this information now. Uh, so the question is, uh, who is the artist and how did he do it? And so everybody, uh, there wasn't a person in the room that wanted to pursue that. And they all said, uh, we don't believe uh, the carbon dating. Something's wrong here. Don't you think this could have happened or that could have happened? So I went into a process and I said, I'll have to be honest with you. I really, I have the same problem. Well, when I left that meeting, I decided I went right over to MIT library and I started looking up on carbon dating. And I found that if you're going to do some carbon dating, you can't be touching the object that you're you know, at all. You can't touch it at all. You just have to be sure that you just put it in tin foil and take a number of samples. And when you think in terms of this cloth, this cloth has been touched and touched and touched forever. Uh, so uh, especially, and we know now with, uh, there's four studies that have shown that the cloth is really uh, uh, 2000 years old. Carbon dating in 19, in uh, 2019 was shown not to be uh, viable because uh, they looked at the statistics and there was no homogeneity in the statistics. So that carbon dating study of 1988 has been really tossed out. Plus we have what we know as pollen spores that are on this cloth. And I met Dr. Max Fry in 1978 and he told me personally that uh, he, when he did this work, he had to travel to different countries to because he found pollen spores not only in France and Italy, but of course, uh, in uh, Asia Minor and all the way down into uh, Palestine and Jerusalem. So that that I give those pollen spores really give us an identity or a, a where let's put it this way it tells us where this cloth has been an itinerary, and we know it's been in Jerusalem. The other fascinating thing was another person that I had met, uh, Fleury Limburg. And she was the uh, a wonderful woman, I still is, I believe. Uh, and uh, she, uh, we, we, in fact, I had dinner at her, we, at her home. She is the one that did the, uh, <clears throat> the repair of the shroud in 2002. And when she did that repair, she found out that uh, she saw that there was this long strip of cloth. It's just a few inches wide. It goes along the entire length of the cloth of the shroud. We know it's this. It, it's it was uh, uh, as old as the shroud because the cloth is the same herringbone weave. It's the same cloth. So somebody's uh, the, what she looked at was the stitch on this cloth, and she found that stitch to be absolutely unique. And the only other place that this stitch, because she was also a historic historian with regard to linen cloths, she had a marvelous background with regard to that, a real expert. Uh, and uh, the, the only places this has been found with this, uh, st uh, this the same unique stitch is uh, on cloth found in Masada. Masada was uh, destroyed by the Romans in 73 AD, and it's only about a two to three day walk from Jerusalem. So that's archeological evidence that really cannot be ignored that really places the shroud where we, you know, where we believe it uh, in, in, the, in the area where Jesus lived. So we have a lot of things going about the date. So I think the date is pretty good. We know that it's an old cloth. We know where it's been. We know it's 2000 years old. So that's sort of out of the way. Uh, what makes this really unique is, of course, the blood marks in the image. And uh, so that's that's where that's why it's unique. <laughs> I want to ask you something, because just a couple days ago, like it was great, it came in right when it did, but someone had sent me a message like the shrouds of fake because there were burial cloths, and you mentioned linens, plural, 
and uh, explain about the facial head. There wasn't there a piece over his head because in John's well, we gospel, the, uh, we have the uh, the sudarium of Oviedo that people talk about that has the same blood type and the same uh, uh, and it has a, a a blood mark that's uh, very much like the blood mark that you find on the shroud. Uh, seem like an imprint, and it ha uh, has also uh, sort of uh, fluids that you get from uh, if you had congestive heart failure or whatever that 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 are on the cloth, uh, and uh, that cloth was uh, uh, supposedly probably used. Uh, um, it was placed over his head while he was being taken down. I they wanted the the Jews were very concerned about not losing the blood or, or fluids from a body uh, of a man who's, uh, who died a violent death. So uh, that was placed on probably uh, while he's being taken down from the cross. This is what they told uh, one of the gentlemen who worked on this had told me uh, that was his, his, uh, his take on this. And then that would have been, of course, buried with the other cloths. We all, we know that there was a large syndone uh, the, the other, uh, the other three, Mark, Luke, and, and uh, uh, Matthew, they all talk about this large syndrome. Jesus was buried in a, in a large sheet. Uh, and uh, that's very, actually talking, uh, and, but, and John actually makes the statement too. John states that Jesus was buried according to the Jewish customs. And it's very interesting. So therefore we know, and, and I, we have, I have learned over the years, and it's, it, this is also in my book, The Shroud of Jesus, uh, and I did this study many years ago, it was published, and uh, it's, it's, not, it's in my book. It, it, it tells us that, uh, let's put, uh, I'm going to take a step back and say, until I started working on this, uh, when I started working on this, I should say, in the, this was in the early 80s, 1980s, I, the, there was a controversy, and the controversy was this. That Pete, uh, there, we know, and it was very well known that anybody who died of, uh, excuse me, anybody who d died in the Jewish world, they had to be washed prior to burial. And so the people that said, well, he, Jesus was buried according to the Jewish custom, he should have been washed. Therefore, this can't be uh, the body of Jesus because uh, he, his body was washed and he's got blood all over the body. And then the other camp said, well, look, they, the, um, the Sabbath is imminent and we need to, um, uh, they didn't have time to do the wash. Uh, they had to get the body buried quickly so that they didn't wash the body. They did everything but wash the body. Well, and that's where it was. And so I started to do a study on this and uh, spent about a year and a half working on this particular project and discovered that there was a, uh, an exception to the washing of the body. And the, the exception is that if a man dies a violent death, the blood is not washed, what, but not washed. It has to remain on the body, and the body is just put into a large sheet and buried, just exactly what we're reading about. And that, that type of understanding is even true today in the, in, in the, in the Jewish world, the Orthodox Jewish world. So you, uh, that's what we have. Did you have a rabbi explain all that to you, though? You know. Oh you, yes, you I had... mean that was a, that was a search. I mean, I went to a number of people, went to the, the library. I, I discovered that you could not find it through the Catholic world. You had to go into the Jewish world to discover that information, uh, and, uh, and 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 it came about. What's fascinating about that is that. Uh, the, the Jews at that, and, and even today, they're very concerned about blood that flows at the time of death. And if the blood flowed, uh, they defined it and they uh, quantitated and qualitated. They quantitated by saying it has to be at least a quarter of a log of blood. Now, a log of blood is um, uh, six eggs. A quarter of a log would be about an egg and a half of fluid. And uh, it had to flow at the time of death. So uh, that's what, and you have to have that amount of blood on you in order to be considered life's, it's considered life's blood. The blood of atonement 
So what we really have here is when we look at the shroud and we see this blood, this is blood from Jesus. This is his life blood. This is blood, the blood of atonement. It's just remarkable, the whole thing. It's just in May, just an amazing thing. And that's what John, when John wrote that, uh, he he understood that. And he, you know, at the time he would have figured, well, everybody knows that if a man dies a violent death, you just wrap him in. So, but that's what the background of it is. And so what he's really telling you that this man was buried in a, had blood on his body. He died a violent death and he had to be buried in a sheet. There you are. You got the whole thing right there when he said had to be done according to the Jewish custom. So that's what happened. Now, just for those watching this and, and may again talk about the earlier carbon dating, what are some of the newer studies they did in the last few years? You know, 40 years is a long time. And well, I did in 2015, they were talking, there's a couple of studies. One was a tensile study, you know, how, you know, the older it gets, the, le the, the you know, it's less. Anyway, I don't want to get into all the details of that. Then there's a couple of uh, other studies they they use. Uh, I can't recall the, the name of the. Uh, um, it, it's a particular study the way they look at the blood and so forth. It, and excuse me, at, at the uh, spectrophotometry. That's it. Uh, the spectrophotometry. Two different studies they did there, and then the final one that those were around 1915. Fonte uh, did those, and then uh, uh, Ducara, I think. Um, a, uh, he uh, did a wonderful study on x-rays uh, and that was done, that was published in actually 2022. And uh, that whereby you look at the, you look at the x, you look at the deterioration of the, of the cloth through some form of x-ray. And it, what they did is they actually took cloth from Masada and they compared it with the shroud and they matched. So it shows how old the cloth is. So that's those are the studies uh, that they did for as far as dating and uh, but the other studies with regard to pollen and with regard to the archaeological study on the on the uh, 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 the stitch that I talked about. I mean, those are all valuable studies. Now, why do you think John didn't mention the shroud when he went in? If well, share with us all you've 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 studied John and you've tied this all together. Share. Just talk about that. Sure. I, I think that one of the things before we do that, though, I, I'd like to mention a, a little bit about um, my attitude and what happened when I started studying this. Actually, uh, I went to, uh, I had read a book many years. Before. I read I read Barbet's book. And then I, did, I uh, in 1978, I saw a picture uh, in the Boston Globe about the fact that the shroud was going to be uh, shown in uh, 1978. So I went to that uh, then, and I met with a number of these, uh, the scientists that were there. We become, a lot of us, uh, I became friendly with a number of them and it's sort of lifetime, lifetime long colleagues. And uh, anyway, it turned out that um, when I came back from Turin, I was actually still skeptic. I was a skeptic. I didn't need the shroud for my faith. I just is it real or not? I, I just wanted to be sure if it was or not. I, I really didn't know. So uh, I began to look at the blood marks and I came across one particular blood mark that fascinated me. It was an off image blood mark. And I started to study that. And then all of a sudden I realized, wow, there was truly a crucified man out of this cloth because this, this blood mark, uh, without getting into too much detail, it was a blood mark off the left elbow. Um, and uh, it told us that he definitely died in the crucified position. That's number one. Number two, just showed you that the blood was a contact process. Number three, because there was no image in that area, and we know that the cloth touched that area because it, it picked up the blood mark, there was no image there, that the image is uh, is not a contact process. In other words, it it, it doesn't go to the uh, it, it it doesn't show up. The, the image doesn't show up because it came in contact with organic matter or something on the body. It's not a contact process. No one knows how this image was formed. Even today, with the technology we have, we cannot reproduce it because the cloth itself, the image is so 
unique. It's on the very topmost fibers of the cloth. And these fibers only run one, one or two fibers deep. And each, the diameter of each one of these fibers is less than a half, less than half the diameters of the hairs on your head. I mean, they're very tiny. And the reason why we see the cloth, we see the the image is because the, those, <clears throat> those fibers have been, uh, uh, the, the, basically a degeneration of the fiber. De, it's called the dehydrative oxidation and it, may, it forms yellowness. Uh, light, heat, and acid can do that, but no one has been able to reproduce the shroud at the microscopic level ever. It's never been done, even with the technology today. So uh, the image... Uh, so anyway, I, I was a skeptic, and I had done a lot of work, and I and I learned a lot about a, a number of the blood marks. But you know, I got to the point where I really did not. Uh, I said, "It's it, we have a fascinating image. Uh, we don't know what happened. Uh, we have this. Uh, we have a, we built the blood marks are consistent with a man who was crucified in the upright position, the vertical position, taken down." put on one end of this cloth, the other end was draped over his body and he was laid out. So I said, There's, there was nothing there that could, that tells me that really this is the moment of the resurrection. People were saying this is the moment of the resurrection, but I had no real good reason for it. So until one day I was doing another work uh, on blood and I, uh, and I did some work with a volunteer and I started to look at this and it turns out that I all of a sudden realized that the hair, uh, I realized several things, but I'm not going to go into all of them. But I realized that the hair of the man of the shroud falls down straight. In other words, as if he would be upright, the hair in the front, the hair in the back. And uh, I was so, all of a sudden when I realized that along with, first I realized, I realized about shadows, but I want to get into all of that because it would take too long. But I realized that he was upright. I was so awestruck by that. I literally, literally backed out of the room that where the, where the, where the shroud pictures were. Uh, it just moved me so much. It was my moment of, of, I had an epiphany there. I said, this is, He's upright, therefore, uh, he is. Uh, this is the moment of the resurrection. I mean, I just I couldn't help but feel that way. So, we, so in other words, we have everything. The blood marks are consistent with a man crucified, placed on a cloth. But the image, in contrast, is not that of a man that's lying in a cloth, but he's a man who is upright. Not only is he upright but I, the feet are crossed, so he's not standing. And that really upset me. I said, why isn't he standing? If he's you know, resurrected, he should be standing. Why is he just sort of looks like he's sitting up there in midair, upright in midair, and I didn't know what to do with that. So I just said, well, the only thing I can do, I said, I, I had no other way to go. I said, I, I guess I'm gonna have to read the gospel. So I'm gonna try to find out if there's something about a man who is suspended upright like that is about Jesus. I have to, so I went to John, excuse me, I went to Matthew, Luke, and, and Mark, and I found really nothing. I got to the Gospel of John and going through it, and finally in chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus himself says, and I, when I am lifted up above the earth, will draw people to myself. I said, wow. He's describing exactly what I'm looking at here on the shroud, an upright man and suspended upright. And then, of course, the next sentence, it says something about his being talking about his being crucified. So I I said, well, I've got to look into that. And so I, I went to Raymond Brown, who's a commentary on the Gospel of John. And right there in the introduction, he talks about Raymond Brown says the culmination of his career, Jesus's career is when he is lifted up to heaven in death and resurrection to draw all men to himself, all people to himself. So um, uh, I then studied it some more and realized that when Jesus talks about being lifted up, he's talking about lift, being lifted up in crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension to the, to the Father. And that's how it's definitely understood because when he talks about being lifted up, 
um, Son of Man must be lifted up in chapter three, that uh, all everybody who believes will uh, have eternal life. You can't have eternal life if you die on a, just on a cross. He has to resurrect and ascend. So it, it's, it, in other words, we're really talking about, every time he talks about being lifted up, he's talking about his hour of glory, the crucifixion, resurrection, ascension back to the Father. So that's that's what we have. So what I did, uh, I was so fascinated by all of this, I then uh, decided I'd go to graduate school. And I took two years of graduate studies in uh, biblical studies uh, and to see if I could learn something about this more. Get, and then later, then I started reading the Gospel of John, and I, and I studied it fairly intently for about 10 years. And what happened was that I, I would think in terms, I was fascinated with John because John, everything that I mentioned to you about blood, John talks about, and also we see it on the shroud. So I wondered if something else was going on in that the gospel that was, you know, that would give us more details about what was going on with from the point of view of the shroud. And uh, as I, the, the more I studied, the more I realized uh, that there, there's a, an incredible connection between what John is saying in the Shroud of Tur in the Shroud of Turin, which is really the Shroud of Jesus, and all of this information is in the book. And there's a number of uh, the, I have six chapters on the Gospel of John. Uh, the first ten chapters are on the forensics history and understanding all of the you know a lot of the forensics, blood, and so forth. But the last six chapters are on the Gospel of John, which goes into a lot of detail of the things we found. But one of the things, the big question was, is there anything uh, in the, the, the clue was basically the upright man. And so I had that I went in with that with that in mind. And the idea was, what is there? Is there anything that really matches what uh, this upright man? And then uh, so fine. Uh, one day, uh, I realized I'm looking at chapter two of Gospel of John, and uh, Jesus, as you recall, goes into the temple, and he's very unhappy with everything going on there with the animals, with the money changers, and he just starts throwing over the money changers, you know, uh, and he says, stop making my father's house a marketplace, and, uh, and, uh, so after he does that, of course, the, uh, the Jews in authority say, what sign can you show us so that, you know, uh, to allow you to do this? And we, we sort of, and for years, I just thought of it as, well, he knocked over the money changers and he was causing a problem there. It's looking, they're looking for a sign they want to show up. But that really wasn't in. All of a sudden, I started to realize that there was something else that he said, which was much more important in which they were very interested in. Uh, in that he said, my father's house. Now that basically he was making a declaration for the very first time, only in, in chapter two, for the very first time, a public declaration, declaration that he is the son of God, it's the father. I'm the son of the father of this house. And it's that, that's the reason why the Jews asked him that, the Jews in authority. And we find that out in chapter five, when Jesus does this again, he calls calls God his father. They want to, that's blasphemy. They want to kill him. So this time, the first time in chapter two, they really, they're asking him for a sign. And Jesus gives them a sign. He says, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. And of course, they thought the temple was the temple that was being built for 46 years. But John makes it very clear. He was saying he was talking about the temple of his body. And I want to emphasize body because Jesus said I will raise it up he will raise his body up and that is exactly what we see on the shroud that raised body of Jesus and so right then and there what we have is Jesus is telling us he's predicting a sign that will tell us that he is the son of God and that sign he has left on his shroud that's the sign 
And that's the sign that John saw when he went into the temple, excuse me, into the tomb. And, uh, and that's a whole other story of how John very carefully connects chapter, uh, the temple story, the, uh, the tomb story and the death story together to have you understand that that's what he saw in the tomb. And one would it and it's a little a little complex well complex to talk about right here, but it's all there in the book. And it's uh, you know, lots of people have been looking at this book. Wonderful theologians have looked at it, and uh, they say, uh, I, I keep asking you, did I do anything wrong? You know, because I wasn't uh, even though I, I took I did formal courses and so forth. And uh, everybody says, no, you, you you haven't said anything wrong, but you have new insights there. And uh, there we are. So uh, the book has been uh, endorsed by wonderful people. Uh, Scott Hahn has endorsed the book. Beautiful endorsement. Mike Aquilina, uh, <clears throat> Father Rocky, Irrelevant Radio, yeah. and a number of others. So it's uh, So we have something beautiful here. We have really uh, the moment of the resurrection reflected on his on this cloth and basically this is a uh, what we call a miracle that's left the only miracle left from the time of Jesus that we, we have here today and <clears throat> this miracle is a uh, what we call a miracle John called a sign and Jesus called a work and the reason why Jesus did these works uh, was because he God understands who we are and that we need works. Jesus would say, uh, I do these works so that you know that I am been sent by the Father and that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. So he's telling us who he is by this. And uh, so it's uh, what we have here is a story, uh, a visual story left to us by God to let us know that he indeed is the son of God and that Doctor, he is. Yeah, could you ahead. explain something? Uh, didn't John say, you know, he, he gets to the tomb before Peter, but he said at one point he saw and believed, but he never said what he saw and he never said what he believed. Can you tell us what that was about? Sure. So, uh, those are fascinating. I remember reading those words in college, and and one day, uh, Mike, can you imagine? I was probably twenty years old, and I, <clears throat> I remember reading. I picked up a commentary and it said that very same thing. What you just said. Uh, there is no object to his what he saw, and no object to what he believed. Uh, it's very interesting because we always sort of think in terms of. Uh, every Easter, they'll bring up this particular story of John, and they don't. They say, well, he saw basically an empty tomb and believed that he's resurrected, you know. Uh, uh, but when you really study that very well, you'll find that at the very end of that, that tomb story, Jesus, uh, John says, uh, after he said he saw and believed, he says, remember, as yet, we did not understand that Jesus was to rise, he was to rise from the dead. Uh, the, and so basically while he's in the tomb, he's telling everybody at the very end, we didn't understand he was to rise from the dead. So that's not what he believed because he's telling you that he didn't rise from the dead. So what did he believe? Well, when you really study the gospel of John, you go through it over and over again, you find out one major thing that he believes and he believes throughout the gospel in many of the chapters that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Messiah and the Son of God. That's what he believes. So that's a not, that's a that's a major move. I mean, it's all right to believe somebody resurrected, but another another move to say Jesus is the Son of God. That's a major move. That's an that's way above just resurrecting Lazarus resurrected. But here we have the word believe in the son of god so what did he see he had to see something quite remarkable in that tomb not just uh, cloths and whatever and what he sees is that he sees the image 
of Jesus upright on that cloth. It's the very image that Jesus, the sign that Jesus predicted in the temple. And he would have remembered that sign that Jesus predicted, and he saw it right there on that cloth. The reason why John could do that is because John had uh, been at the death scene, and he describes the death scene. And when you look at the death scene, you find that Jesus is hanging on a cross, his hair is falling to his shoulders, his uh, feet aren't touching the ground, he has a wound to the side, his legs aren't broken. And everything you see, and he describes there basically is what you see in the shroud, except for the arms being folded down. Not only that, he connects this by Gezerah Saba, which is a, a way of connecting something by words, similar words. So he says what he saw is what he describes as in, in the death scene about what G, the body of Jesus sort of hang upright, and uh, and then what and then and then he also connects it to the very important uh, scene, the temple scene, when Jesus gives the sign. So Jesus predicted that his body would be raised up. And that's what he sees on the cloth. Therefore, Jesus gave that sign to tell the world that he is the son of God. And so therefore, John saw the upright man of the shroud in the tomb. And he therefore believed because Jesus, the predicted sign that Jesus gave was to show that he was the son of God. And so he believed right in that moment that Jesus is the son of God because he saw his sign, the sign that he had predicted. Now, again, in your book title, uh, let me hold this up. The Shroud of Jesus and the sign John ingeniously concealed. Was that the sign that he ingeniously concealed or was it something else? Well, that's the sign. That's the sign of the upright Jesus. And uh, he had to do that. He had to conceal it. You say, well, why didn't he... Uh, why didn't he... Uh, talk about the image he could have told us right then and there about that image and we'd all be happy about that we would really now we you know put it all together but he couldn't do that because if he had done that uh you find that if you read Josephus and which who lived at the very same time as John during that same period of time you know anything that had and if you read the Mishnah also you find that if a man uh if there's any uh, image with you know hand or foot or whatever uh, from the Jewish perspective uh, that would be considered an object of idolatry and would be torn up and teared you know and thrown into the Dead Sea I mean he, that would not be tolerated so he if he had mentioned at all about this image he knew that that they would people would just do anything they could to find out where it was and destroy it so it was a major thing that he ha could not speak about and, but he left absolute clues. Uh, the whole thing is, it all, it all comes together. And so what's really exciting is really, in a sense, the last six chapters of the book is so exciting in the sense of discovering and understanding what this is all about, that the, that, and that the lifted man of the shroud gives us so much information about what God is trying to reveal to us. And that's that goes on in the rest with the with all the rest of those six it's found within those six chapters so what we're doing is we're finding out not only that the man is upright but that john really this was a cloth that john actually saw we just an amazing uh new understanding of the gospel of john well, Dr. Lavoy, you, you've written a beautiful book, and uh, and Sophia Press uh, did a did a wonderful job in this printing. It's available at Sophia. It's s o p h i a institute dot com. Dr. Lavoy, any final message? I mean, we just skimmed the topic. You've been doing this for forty years, so in 35, 40 minutes, we're not going to, you know, touch all the bases. But any closing thoughts before we wrap up today's show? Well, I think that what this, what we need to think in terms of is letting our youth know about this wonderful uh, information that that of what God has left us. He, he communicates to us through a cloth and through His Son's cloth and image, telling us that uh, 
that this this event took place something that we can see it's really a true miracle that that occurred then and we can see it today it's one of the it's the most important it's the uh resurrection and ascension of his son to the father it tells us that god is real the uh spiritual life is real eternal life is real uh and it's really very exciting all you need are your eyes and your mind to understand what's there right in front of you and that is so important and i think with uh we should be getting this uh information to our youth uh many uh youth is uh losing faith uh, to, like 40 percent of our youth are going to no faith at all they uh and i think something like this would be of great benefit to to youth and to also to the rest of the world who doesn't know about about christ at all and uh because this is something that is in hand you can see it decide for yourself and that's what the book is about i decided that i would not I'd talk about things that you couldn't see the lord created a front and back image uh, there's a lot more information uh, from a point of view of anatomy to understand why this man is upright i'm not going to go into that now uh, but you, you people can just see this for themselves make their own mind up whether uh, they can understand what this really is uh, it's not a matter of just my saying it and saying well i'm a doctor whatever no this is made for everybody so uh, the 80 80 photographs in the book and those are going to tell you and show you uh, what really is going on here. So, but I want to thank you very much for your time here today and uh, for allowing me to participate with you. And I, God bless you for all the work you've been doing all these years. What is it, 25 years you've been yeah, doing this? 25, 30 years on Divine Mercy. And of course, you know, the Shroud of Turin is the same Jesus that's in the image. And uh, God is alive and well. And your uh, your book, I think just nailed it. It's, I really encourage viewers to get the book. It'll help you build your faith. You know, sometimes, doctor, I hear people say, well, who cares whether it's real or not? I believe in Jesus. Well, that's great. But, you know, so many human beings in our life and situations, we go through doubts. And especially in trials and suffering, we wonder, where are you, God? And, and this book just ties it together and says, this is all real. Jesus was not a mythical figure. Jesus was crucified died and was buried and he rose from the dead and i just want to thank you for all these years of work and like a good physician and scientist you look for truth and uh people i hope you enjoyed the show um subscribe and share spread the good news get the book we gotta this is how we're going to spread the faith and uh so i want to thank everybody and you especially doctor but thank everybody who watches this show and uh spread the good news so Doctor, again, it's been my joy, and I hope our paths cross, cross again soon. Well, thank you very much. God bless you, and God bless all your uh, visitors and people that have been with you all these years. God bless all of them. Amen. Thank you so much. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel for the video portion. The podcast can be heard at anchor.fm slash drbryan, B-R-Y-A-N, Thatcher, T-H-A-T-C-H-E-R and on all the major podcast forums. I would love to speak at your church or conference, and please consider supporting our efforts to spread the truth to a hurting world. Thank you again. And for more information, go to the website at drbryanthatcher.com.